My name is Carolyn Vera. Hi, I'm Melanie Cervantes. Um, so to start off, I just we just want to give a brief history of the Multicultural Community Center. So I'm an intern here at the Multicultural Community Center, and the space, the MCC, was one out of student struggles, out of 69, but most importantly, out of the 99 Third World Liberation Front strikes, where students demanded a community center. And out of those, and out of that struggle and of that fight, we got this center that we have now, right? Um, so we're always in the process of growing, right? This is a temporary space for the MCC. So we're rooted in social justice, popular education, um, and our communities. So thank you so much for coming to the Art from American Cultures. Um, we're here to celebrate the 25th anniversary, and most importantly, to hear Melanie Cervantes talk about art and the role of resistance and activism. Um, just a brief reminder that this is a week long of events. So there's events Wednesday through Friday going on, culminating in a big talk with Pedro Noguera, who's also a Cal alum. So I will give a brief um, intro to, to today's conversation and then a biography on Melanie Cervantes. So this talk today is on the role of art and activism in social change, and we're hoping to, to speak to the Ida Rebelde and Meg Melanie's work, but also um, briefly mention the 25th anniversary of American Cultures, which was a huge historic moment for UC Berkeley, and really culminated in universities across the, uh, across the country really implementing what is in American Cultures requirement, where you're required to take a course that centers race and ethnicity if you want to graduate. Right, which I think was an attempt to get the stories and narratives of students of color to be central and to be understood, right, in a time where we still hear that students get in on affirmative action or we still have racial microaggressions happen to us every damn day, right? Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and read Melanie Cervantes' amazing bio. So Melanie Cervantes is a Chicana graphic artist who creates images that reflect the hopes and dreams of social movements with the goal of catalyzing people to action. Her work includes black and white illustrations, paintings, installations, and paper stencils, but she is best known for her prolific production of political screen prints and posters, one which you could see to your right. Employing vibrant colors and hand-drawn illustrations, her work moves those viewed as marginal to the center, featuring powerful youth, elders, women, and queer and indigenous peoples. Melanie's training as an artist began with her mother and father. She learned color theory while helping her mother select fabric for school clothes at the LA swap meets. And she developed some of her technical skills by watching her dad repurpose neighborhood junk into her childhood treasures. Melanie built on this knowledge by studying library books, designing and constructing her own clothes, and forging friendships with other creative people. At UC Berkeley, she received formal training in ethnic studies, hey, ethnic <laughs> studies. And in 2004, she graduated with a bachelor's degree. She fuses what she learned in ethnic studies with her art skills and strong decolonizing pro politics in order to become a, power, a powerhouse, powerhouse artist of the people. Her most revered mentor is her partner and fellow printmaker, Jesus Barraza, with whom she formed Dignidad Rebelde a collaborative graphic arts project that translates the stories of struggle and resistance into artwork, and into artwork that most importantly can be put back into the hands of the communities who inspire it, right? So she has exhibited extensively throughout the U.S., including Yerba Buena Center uh, for the Arts in SF, the National Museum of Mexican Art in Chicago, <laughs> and the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Internationally, her, her art has also had a broad reach in streets and institutions in Egypt, Mexico, Thailand, Slovenia, Palestine, France, Venezuela, Switzerland, Guatemala, hey. Um, her work is in public collections of the Library of Congress, Center for the Study of Political Graphics, Latin American Collection of the Green Library at Stanford, and the Hispanic Research Center at the Arizona State University, as well as various private collections throughout the U.S. She's also an experienced grant maker and thought leader with nearly a decade of experience working in progressive philanthropy to support movement building. She currently works full-time as a program officer at the Akhenati Foundation, 
which supports movement building organizations working to finally put an end to the structural racism, which lies at the heart of social inequality and inequity in the US. And again, she holds a, a BA in ethnic studies from Cal, so she's our family and our community, because most of us here are ethnic studies majors. Um, so yeah, give it up. I just want to first thank um, Victoria and Douglas for inviting me to um, not only speak tonight but also to engage in a collaborative process to create a graphic that um, could hopefully uh, be a good reflection of some, some of the history of what the American culture's requirement um, has behind it and some of what um, is currently actively happening. I think it was um, a wonderful process to go through together. Um, and I feel like uh, the opportunity is always to build community. And I feel like in that process, I feel like I've been able to reconnect in a deeper way um, back to the campus community, which I felt like there was a, you know, I had done really well right after I graduated. And then there was like, a couple years where there was a bit of a lull because people graduate and then you lose your contacts. And so it's nice to get that, that reconnection going. Um, I'm not sure if the slideshow's mirroring from the computer, but I do have a presentation I prepared today. Um, the, I think it's important to, to have the conversation about the graphic I created, um, but really, to contextualize that in a history, um, and in particular in the history that we come out of. There's a historical arc, arc of um, political graphics being developed in partnership, in collaboration, in, um, inspired by social movements throughout the world. Um, this isn't an exhaustive presentation, I think we would probably have to have a whole semester of coursework <laughs> to do that. Um, and I'm not really kind of here to dump coins into a bank of information. I'm here to just share a story of how I have um, the opportunity, the privilege, um, to be able to sit here in front of you and share a story. And so these stories add up to um, to lead me to be in that place. So if we could go to the first slide. Um, so got to mention um, part of a collaborative project called the Unidad Rebelde. Um, we really envision the space, not just as Jesus and I, we also have um, our comrade Bobby Fuentes in the front row here, who's uh, a newer member of our crew, but essential also. Um, and we see it as this space where people can come in and out of collaboration. Um, it's really been influenced, I think, by social movements that have happened both in our lifetime, but also critical social movements that have, have happened and been envisioned based on a worldview that we share, like Zapatismo um, and the the work that has come out of the Chicano movement but with a gender lens. Um, and so the main thrust of what we're trying to do in this collaborative project is to build community, to envision a different future, um, to not just name the problems, but to really say what it is that we're, you know, to, to lay out what it is that we're fighting for at the end of it all. And to do that, in a graphic way, in, in an image-based way. Um, and, and it's important to us that we put that work into the hands of the people, because art can be a very elitist project. It can be a project of exclusion. Um, and that's not the kind of work that we want to create. We want to create the kind of art that was seamless to what we do in our everyday lives, you know? Um, as indigenous people, I think often there's this notion of like, what is art? This is a new concept. It's a very um, Western concept where it's over there and the artist is over there instead of just 
being part of our everyday lives. And so I think we want to try to return to that um, kind of everydayness and be able to see many of us as creators so that the thing that's not reflected in this, and I feel we have to kind of update this statement, is the desire to also put the process of making back into the hands of the people. So we also do a lot of skill sharing and training, and that's part of a, a tradition as well. Um, for the most part, these traditions have been handed down not through art schools, but through mentorship and relationship. And that's the way we've come to it. Neither of us have trained. Well, Jesus is now in art school, so that's the, for the first time. But um, the basis of our, our collaborative is not in the art schools. It's in ethnic studies, Jesus went um, to state in Raza studies. So we come out of that worldview. Uh, next slide. <coughs> so this is a picture of what it looks like when, we, when we're doing um, at least one of the things that we strive to do, which is putting the art into the hands of the people who inspire it and into those that are most impacted by the social problems that we're trying to address. This is a photo from one of the largest mobilizations against um, SB 1070 in Arizona. It was a call to action after the bill had been signed into law and 100,000 people converged um, onto the streets of Phoenix in order to protest um, this really racist um, law and we knew we weren't going to be able to make it out um, but we were able to um, do what we do best I think which is create graphics and bring people together to do skill shares and create art and so over the course of the summer leading up to this action we were able to do three community print days um, and we brought dozens and dozens of people together, probably close to 100 different people together in the three different um, sessions. And I think over the course of that summer, we probably sent something like 4,000 posters to Arizona in the trunks of people's cars, all handmade. Um, I really liked talking about it as the love letters that people from the base sent to folks in Arizona, because some of the people that participated in these workshops were like undocumented and based here in the Bay and you know they might be like the parents and they were in this quandary do I go and risk um, being caught up in kind of the, the situation that's um, happening in Arizona and I think you know it was earlier on before kind of the undocumented and unafraid part of the movement had really thrust out so there's a hesitancy. So this, this gave people a platform to be able to speak, right? To be able to say something and send a note of solidarity and a poster that could be handed out. Um, next slide. So I'm gonna start by talking about a um, political cartoonist, Jose Guadalupe Posada. He was um, born in Central Mexico. Um, and we're looking back to 1852, first slide. Um, that's a picture of him at the taller that he had um, in Mexico City on the right. And this image is probably the, one of the images that is the most popular and well-known and um, highly popularized, particularly with the um, adoption of Dia de los Muertos um, celebrations in the United States. Um, so it's like Calavera Catrina it was poking fun at like rich ladies in Mexico, <laughs> you know, with their fancy hats, and, you know, it's, it's used over and over again, and often anonymously, people might not know Posada's name, um, but he used the skeleton, the, the calaca, to really poke fun at the, the political elite, the um, incredibly wealthy, and um, he did it in newspapers, and he worked for a bunch of different newspapers. Next slide. Um, and he did a lot of different kinds of pieces. And um, one of the things that's interesting is because a lot of political graphic artists within Latin America point to him as like, you know, he was kind of like one of those primary um, influences. Um, and I think, you know, they see images like this of Zapata, right? Um, and if you don't know his history, like you could create a big mythology about like he was such a radical leftist 
And if you actually spend time with some of the editorials that he was illustrating, you start to see a different picture. So this year is the 100th anniversary of his death. No, 2013 was the 100th anniversary of his death. And Jesus and I actually had the fortune of being in Mexico and there was at least 20 exhibits on his work um, throughout the FA. Next slide. And we really came to see how pieces like this by Leopoldo Mendes from the Taller de Grafica Popular um, really mythologized Posada. You know, they show him, you know, working in his studio, that studio that was in the first picture, looking out at the revolution, capturing it within, you know, this etching. And then, you know, you have the intellectual kind of um, leaders and the, the folks who, you know, who really influenced the ideology of the, of the revolution, the Flores Magón brothers, like hanging out with him in his studio, um, you know, looking on to him doing his work. And this is so far from the reality of his life. <laughs> it's just really funny. But um, this ethos goes on, this mythology goes on. And the reality is, I think regardless of his actual politics, he actually was able to um, create political graphics at a time, you know, during the revolution when other kinds of imagery weren't being, you know, codifying what was happening. And so you have um, some photos, but it was much more limited in terms of imagery. Um, but you do have Bosala's images. And he is able to create these works that are very dynamic, that have a lot of action in them. Um, that do capture what was happening, um, regardless of like whether he was in contradiction with his own beliefs. And I think, you know, there's a lot of theorizing that's happening now. You know, 100 years later, um, I don't think there's a consensus around that. But uh, th that's the reality. You know, he he had some very um, profound works. The Villas Muertos pieces are incredibly impactful. I think. It, because of the way that they uh, mark a presence, particularly for Chicano Latino communities practicing this cultural celebration in the US. And yet there's like this question of like, what were the actual politics? Uh, next slide. So, Bolsava was a, an incredibly influential artist and the person who created that piece I just showed, Leopoldo Mendes, was one of the founders of the Tierra Gráfica Popular, which is, um, probably one of the first collective workshops um, that we can point to that actually had kind of clear political lines around things that were happening in the world. Um, and they were heavily influenced by uh, Posada's work. Um, this is an example of a collective process. So there was various artists one of the drawbacks of this picture is none of the women, because there were women that were part of the Etnografica Popular are captured in this photo. <laughs> They're actually really marginalized in a lot of the his histories. Um, but we do have a friend who's working on a book that's gonna write some of those histories that have been kind of marginalized and silenced. Um, but they had a collective process where uh, an organization could come to them and say, you know, we really want to, you know, address fascism in Italy and how it's impacting people in Mexico. And that organization would be told, okay, come back in a week. And then they would take it to all of the artists in that group and they would discuss who was best suited to create that political graphic um, based on the needs of the organization. And then they would do group critiques of like the sketches that would come from that process in order to best serve um, the needs of those organizations. So next slide. And they did a range of different issues because just like today, what we confront, there's a lot of things that need to be improved, a lot of things that need to be changed from, you know, student organizing to, you know, broader things around um, the state of war happening throughout the world. Next slide. Um, you know, poverty and hunger, to even just kind of calling out um, the, the white hats and like the killings that were happening during that time. Next slide. Um, 
So they, they range from kind of looking at labor, looking at um, issues that are global, really, they were, I'd say of all their kind of political leanings, they were extremely clear on their line around anti-fascism. Um, because they were such a big collective, there's some places where there's some political um, contradictions as a group because the individuals might have had uh, different perspectives, but they are incredibly um, productive and create tons of work and actually um, really capture a lot of what was happening, you know, post-revolution um, at a time when fascism was really kind of a, a major global concern um, and using political graphics um, in a collective way to inform um, the masses, which, you know, I think one of the things that they were really clear about is like, at, at this time, there's a nationalizing project happening in Mexico. So one of the things is to address illiteracy, right? And so there's this need to kind of bridge um, communicating with folks that are in the process of maybe learning how to read with the fact that folks maybe don't know how to read. So they were really clear, like having a visual language is something that people can access regardless of literacy or not. You know, they do have additional messaging, but that's one of the benefits of, of doing graphic space work is it's a whole language unto itself, right? Like even when you have messaging, you can communicate a slew of ideas um, based in, in iconography, based in images, um, when it's done well. Next slide. Um, though we're gonna fast forward <laughs> a quite a bit, um, about three decades, to the 1960s, the organization of uh, solidarity with the people of Asian, Africa, and Latin America, or OSPAL. Um, this is a group that came out of um, the Bandung Conference. It was like the non-aligned um, nations that were like, okay, we're gonna get together, and they have this major meeting, and what, and it's pretty much the parallel to what's happening kind of in the politic of like Third World Liberation Front. Like so Third World Liberation Front and that identity around Third World Unity really comes out of the, those kind of political um, spaces. So what they decide is like they have people from all over. They have like Quechua folks, they have folks from the US out here in Oakland, they have people from Palestine all working on a magazine called the Tricontinental. And within each issue of the Tricontinental, which really deals with issues that are happening all around the world, the Vietnam War, I mean, everything that's happening in the 60s is being addressed in this magazine. Uh, they have a pull-out poster in the middle of that magazine. So that's one of the vehicles um, to start to create what um, is termed as the solidarity poster. So we're really rooted in their practice of connecting issues um, between communities. So um, the reality is too, a lot of artists that were coming out of the 60s here in the US that were coming out of the movements here on campus at the Third World Liberation Front and the, and the Ethnic Studies College stri um, Strike Third World Liberation Front at SF State, were having these practices, and some of them actually went to Cuba and were engaged with these artists. Um, but that practice and analysis of connecting struggles um, is really manifested visually in their works. Um, they're often doing their works in multiple languages, like three or four, because they also understand that this needs to reach people globally. Next slide. Um, and like I said, they're addressing kind of global issues, like uh, all the, you know, pretty much everything that's happening within um, what was termed the third world at the time. Next slide. Um, so you have like folks like Emery Douglas, who's the Minister of Culture of the Black Panther Party, um, corresponding with people in Cuba in order to do 
um, this kind of collaborative piece that was really talking about uh, solidarity with folks that were organizing as Panthers throughout the U.S. in, in Oakland, but also the other chapters throughout the U.S. Um, and we're fortunate to still have a very engaged Emory Douglas. He's um, incredibly supportive of the younger folks um, coming up in his footsteps. Um, but we've actually been able to talk to him, like what did it actually take to create these graphics? And um, there's, and we've talked to other artists like Jane Norling who talk about being in one room with people that could talk, speak all the different languages that were on the poster because I was like, you know, as we're practicing, you know, we have to find resources, but they were so organized that they had people from all these different places working on the magazine. So they had this infrastructure that allowed them to be working together, um, which is a little different from what we have today. Next slide. Um, so then we're, we kind of position ourselves back to the U.S. and look at um, the posters from the Chicana Chicano movement in the in the U.S. But um, particularly within the Southwest and particularly within California, uh, the examples that I pulled um, mostly in California. There's some like this first slide um, actually are images I think of what are three major threads of the Chicana Chicano movement. Um, the labor rights piece, which is really focused on the farm workers. Next slide. Which was a very, not just the Chicano fight, you know, it would have been impossible without the Filipino farm workers who organized the Chicanos to go on strike. I feel like it's really important, especially when you have movie, you know, popular movies like the Cesar Chavez movie, um, potentially being one of the only ways that people are accessing those histories. And then people actually, people like um, Philip Veracruz and Larry Idliong and, and others being erased in many ways from those stories, um, which is it's a travesty because you know, like uh, I did a portrait of Philip Cruz, and it was fortunate enough to be able to talk about the piece in the Central Valley in, um, in Fresno. And we had one of um, Cesar Chavez's neighbors, this woman who was an elder, uh, talk about how she would see them come and knock on Cesar's door, like day after day, asking him the same question, will you join the strike? So it was a very, like for me, like, having that access to not just telling the story for me, which I'm like, oh, I read this book, <laughs> you know, really opened up my eyes. It was like from this ethnic studies perspective, but this woman lived it. Um, it's important to, to acknowledge those connections. Um, to the other two threads of, of the movement, I mean, there's other things, but these I think are the major threads that I talked about. Um, the blowouts, the, the organizing around kind of education, justice, and equity um, for uh, FASA youth. Next slide. And um, then finally, the fights around um, land, which is a, probably not talked enough about, um, because I, I would say, from my analysis, you know, the land-based fight is one of the biggest fights that we have, because everything else revolves around it. Um, this is an image from Guerra Maria um, with Reyes Lopez de Gerina. Um, but those being kind of the most um, pronounced pieces of the movement. Next slide. Uh, so this is actually one of the very first documented political graphics from uh, what we would call the period of the Chicano Chicano movement. And this is from Guerra Maria um, by Ernesto Emanuel Martinez. Uh, Jesus actually had the opportunity to interview him and talk to him a little bit about um, how he came to this. I don't know if you want to say anything about that. I mean, I think to me the coolest thing about this was that we think about street art today, but he talks about <laughs> how this was a poster which was really small. It was like a regular sheet of paper because they were learning how to do this. And Rini Templeton, that Templeton actually taught them how to do this. And they printed a bunch of these and they would go out in the middle of the night and lead cases around town at a point when the land struggle was actually a struggle. 
And he talked about how, like dangerous it was that they were doing this, but they would go out at night and just eat pasties and kind of show, take a position about what was going on. Yeah, which I think it's interesting. Like you're saying, you know, <clears throat> in 2014, street art has become, it goes back to that like very privileged, somewhat elitist um, method for people that are going into the into kind of art schools with, with that privilege already trying to find a way to make it into the art world often at least that's that's my perspective but i think it's important again to how do we reclaim some of these things when we talk about street art right like who is actually you know who are some of the folks that are out in the street and what were they actually articulating not just an ethos but an actual politic and a political position um and this one's from 1967 66 yeah it's like yeah one of the yeah first it's been one of the first ones next slide um, to folks that came out of the SF state struggles, Rupert Garcia, um, who is you know very well known in the art world, very well established now, he was creating these kind of pieces in order to fundraise to pay the bail for folks that got arrested during the Third World Liberation Front strike. Um, so we actually found, I think it was in La Massa magazine, one of the advertisements for people to be able to order these if they weren't like local. And it was like, all right, $5 if you're faculty, two fifty dollars if you're a student for these posters. Um, the funny thing is now, if you wanna buy a piece like this, it's like, yeah, a lot more than that. <laughs> a lot more than that. But, um, but you know, it was rooted and um, connected to that struggle to get that college, you know, and, and he, uh, he, one of the interesting um, trends that you see is a lot of the kind of um, folks that were founding in these practices around printmaking and political graphics were actually veterans. So he was a veteran. Um, he had gone to South Korea and came back and was, you know, he went through his programs and really got politicized, um, I think, through that experience um, and found, you know, that he, he had, I think, a love for art throughout his life, but then found this, this voice and this position and this connection to the organizing happening at SF State. Next slide. Oh, I have a similar story with Malakias Montoya. Um, he's, I think, a lot of his graphics are very well known that are coming out of the farm workers struggle, but then also he's a, a good example of one of those artists that was, um, not nationalist, because I think a lot of times that label gets put onto folks that were involved in the Chicano movement, but he was very internationalist from the get. You know, like this is probably one of the best known pieces, um, kind of creating this connection between um, Chicanos and um, Vietnamese folks and soldiers in particular, and like really kind of um, creating that, that line of solidarity between what it means to be engaged in the Vietnam War and what um, what dis disengaging from that relationship means. Um, so Malakias was a grad student here at UC Berkeley in the art department during the um, the original '69 um, struggles, and he's talked about how you know <laughs> there's a moment where he kind of stopped going to some of his classes, and it, but he was producing all these graphics very similar. He, he also has stories of creating graphics to pay for bail <laughs> for the movements, but there was always a need, like, oh, there's this event, can you make a poster Malakias? Oh, like, we really need this, can you make a poster Malakias? And he all said yes, and um, so at the end of, like, a semester, he came back to one of his art um, professors and said, well, you know, we're looking at a portfolio review, look at, these are all the posters I've created, this is, this is what I have to show you. And um, the professor said, well, this is more work than many of the other students have done and it's phenomenal. And so he actually ended up becoming a professor after graduating from grad school here and really founded some of what um, is really critical to the Bay Area in creating a connection between the university and what we see in programs like ACES 
and the community. So he would have students in his classes. Um, their homework would be like create a poster for La, La Raza um, um, Centro de Le, um, La Raza Centro Legal or La, La Clinica de la Raza. Like that's your homework. You have to create a, a poster for X event that they're doing. And, and it created this opportunity for people to get out of the bubble that Berkeley can be and really engage with folks, particularly in Oakland, and, and to create this practice in the taller that was about building community amongst the students, amongst other people that lived um, here, not just in the university town, but lived here in the Bay more permanently. Um, and he's sustained that. They, they have a taller up in Woodlands, which is outside of the Davis, called the taller the Arte de no, the Nuevo Amanecer, um, and they're continuing that tradition of bridging community and university. Um, but again, his roots are connected to the Third World Liberation Front and the struggles happening on campus. Next slide. Um, and then I think, again, for me as a Chicana, it's important to, to not um, be have blinders on around the, the mujeres that were really active. So um, a lot of people may know Yolanda Lopez for her portrait of um, the Virgen de Guadalupe uh, running and kind of stepping on the serpent. It's, it's probably one of her most circulated pieces, but lesser known are, is like her political graphics and the posters that she created. Um, for Bastaya, which is a, a newspaper. That's another thread that you see, the, the role of newspapers, um, oppositional newspapers, in the practices of graphic artists throughout all of the generations and throughout all of the Um So this is, this is an example of a work that's lesser known. It was around Los Siete. Um, and I think it's important because yeah, she was very prolific. I mean, she also created, which I don't have in here, an image that we recently got to reprint because we had this print party on Sunday that has um, an image of a man. And, and he looks like a danzante, and he's pointing at you, and he says, who's the illegal alien pilgrim, which is maybe another one that's well known. So she did create these political graphics, but I think she's um, better known for her paintings. So it's important to, I think, give her props for that work that was really critical and sometimes, I think, viewed um, in a way that is seen as anonymous. But it was a Chicana that created that. Next slide. Um, Linda Lucero is another local artist, um, as well as Esther Hernandez, um, who have been really kind of critical voices um, whether they're talking about um, the independistas of Puerto Rico or uh, tackling issues of contaminated um, water in the Central Valley, uh, both have created really kind of phenomenal works um, that address political issues that are happening in their community and that they're directly connected to. Next slide. Um, the, the last slide in this section is of Juan Fuentes. This is one of Jesus's mentors, actually, uh, who he met through the Mission Cultural Center in San Francisco. Uh, Juan was actually uh, Rupert Garcia's roommate at one point. Uh, he's a little bit younger than Rupert, but also came out of the Third World Liberation Front struggle at SF State and trained generations of, of young people um, who came in through the Mission Cultural Center in this practice of connecting community and students. Next slide. Uh, and then I just have a couple slides to give examples of what Grafica has produced um, from various artists. And then this is actually starting to bridge like the 70s and 80s. Next slide. Um, next slide. And then we get into artwork. So um, I don't have a lot of pieces. I just wanted to kind of show examples of the different ways we work from local issues that are happening, like the, the police murder of Oscar Grant, to the commemoration of the um, re 
occupation of Alcatraz by the Indians of all tribes. Um, next slide. National issues or national movements that are happening, like I Don't Know More or Occupy. And international solidarity graphics, like this graphic that expresses solidarity with Egypt and Tunisia, or this um, piece that Jesus did in solidarity with um, organizers in Indonesia fighting a cement plant that is degrading the environment there. Next slide. So I had a couple slides of folks that are from the Bay Area that have done work around uh, South African divestment. And um, this one's from Rupert Garcia. I think he actually did this one to connect to the fundraising that was happening around Mandela. Um, and then this one's by Lincoln Cushing. Next slide. And um, it's a little bit of an injustice, but I wanted to show just the spectrum of pieces that folks from South Africa had done, because there was a very robust um, movement of political graphics happening um, throughout kind of the spectrum of people that were organizing against apartheid. Um, but I'm less versed in that because it's not, we don't have the same kind of direct connection. So I didn't want to kind of do it an injustice. Next slide. So that gets us finally to the piece that I created um, in collaboration with folks at the American Cultural Center. Um, and I wanted to just show the direct influence. I, I studied a bunch of different South African posters and I really um, was informed by this one on the left. Um, and you can, I mean, I, I feel like I don't have to explain it. You can see some of the ways that I paralleled that given um, how rooted the history of uh, the center and the requirement are in the anti-apartheid movement on ca campus. Um, I felt like it was important to echo that visually also, and then also kind of the colors that are used as the palette for the poster um, echo that as well. And I think that's the last slide. Some contact info. So that's the slideshow. Uh, it's a quick and dirty uh, set of images to to give people an introduction to all the movements that have used political graphics or not all some. I mean, lost some people. Oh my gosh. So, Carol, you want to ask some questions? Sure. Uh, thank you. That was, that was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so then, you spoke a lot. I had not seen half of the graphics, so I was no. but. Um, a lot of how communities of color specifically have used this, these kinds of uh, like posters to build community. So I think I would want to ask something around like, one, how do you see this form of collaborative and, and um, community art building as a way to to build solidarity with one another? Yes, within the Bay, but also transnationally, which I think you also spoke to, um, and and a broad one like, how do you see art as a tool for social transformation, and why? Um, so I think throughout the history of these practices, people have seen the workshops or the talleres not just as a production space, not just as a here, here's how you do step one to five and then you have a printed poster, but as a community building space that um, not everyone's gonna respond to a door knock um, and be ready to engage um, or to be recruited in one of their classes to come to an action, you know. And that's not necessarily how social movements work. You know, there's a lot of different roles you can play in a social movement. And so one of the roles that cultural work like dietis and workshops offer is another opportunity to engage in the same issues, but through a different entry point. And some people are really enlivened by creating something from nothing together. And so I think um, th that practice also offers that platform for people to imagine in that way, right? Like Because often our politics are in response to you know, some oppression. I think there's something that's, that draws people into being able to create 
and to do it collectively also. It's also like, um, like this pre-visioning of what coming together can, can do. Um, so I think, you know, with us, we've done the skill shares because it's not just about like, how does everyone go out to, you know, a specific action, but, but how do we come together and tell our stories, talk about what's happening in our communities, and then start to figure out what we think some of the solutions are, um, how we can support each other, like that kind of mutual support. Um, that, you know, it may not be something that's immediately connected, but it's important that that person receive the support, and that's, that's what building community is to me. Um, and I think the reason that I've always been drawn to um, creation and you know like what we look at as creative arts is the power of creation you know like i think there's so many ways that institutionally it's taken from us you know that if you look at um schools that have had um years and years of disinvestment the arts are always one of the things that is on the chopping block really early but privileged students have a lot of access, right? And I think that's on purpose. So um, in utilizing like the arts as a way to build community, we are able to like reconnect to the power of that creation. And so I think that also gives us like a really good platform to having like relationship with other folks and um, you know, like the concept of like, you're my other me, like seeing, seeing us having linked fates with people, not just in, in the global north, not just in the US, not just in Oakland, not just in our neighborhood, but like having this broader view, I think like art and creating it is a perfect vehicle for that um, because it taps into this emotional landscape. You know, I think, um, there's other ways that we get really disconnected and we're just like these brains, but then we have like all these emotions and we have bodies and we're able to feel all that through the arts um, in a different way that allows us to still hold the politic and you know have a political project, but not let go of like what we feel, and how we feel that together, not just like as these individuals. <laughs> um, great. We'll also, we're also open to questions from anyone, um, but I also wanted to to bring in, and Jesus Barraza could also feel free to, sorry to answer, but but what are your art processes in terms of producing art for Vida Vida Rebelde, right? Um, and I know that you just had your art making party for May 1st on Sunday, which is amazing, right? Supporting, supporting all of the work that folks do on the daily, but especially on May 1st. So what are your, because they seem so collective and I feel that um, as someone who, who does not and has not have, had access to these to these vehicles of creation, I feel that I, I can be connected through the way you all circulate it through social media. You always let people download it, like, oh, you could download it, right? And you can print it in your house or put it up. You know, which I think is kind of, or I know that there was a moment where, and maybe it's still happening, where you were pasting art pieces on the bus stop. Right, like let me put this at the bus stop and let somebody pick it up, right? So, which I think is something really fundamentally radical when we think of art, that shit is pretentious. You know, especially for at UC Berkeley, where like the art institution is so far away and, and it's mostly like upper class white students and you don't see many students of color in there and if you do, it's a war, right? It's a war and it's a battle to survive. So if you could speak to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um it's funny because I think of like even my bio is very like geared towards the traditional, <laughs> right? It's like here's all the credentials for why like my art can be, um, I don't know, whatever, valued, I guess. Um, but then I'm like, well, but it also gets into the streets, you know, like, um, and it, it, it's held up. You know, what we do is held up in picket signs and it's in people's kitchens and it's in the schools. And so the process is, I think, the value around the collective is, is so core to everything. So the process 
many times is a collaborative process. So like the way that we created the ACES graphic was collaborative. We sat down and we, we chatted and we talked. We talked story. And asked some hard questions. Yeah. And had time for reflection, which I think often when we're, so, when we're engaged in our work, you know, which is often political work, we don't have enough time for reflection. And so this gives us a time to pause and ask some questions about like, well, you know, what is it you're really trying to do and who are you, who are you really trying to talk to and engage with and, and what's the vision of that and what's important when you look back, you know? Um, which are just some of the questions. Um, but it, I think what, the short term process is, you know, like getting together and having a conversation, but the long term process is building relationship, right? So that's just the beginning. Like, I, that's what I feel like came out of this process for me is like the beginning was just having this opportunity to make a poster, but the long term is like hopefully connecting with different people that came here. You know, if they reach out and there's some need or like some way we can support what's happening on campus and vice versa folks can come out to the front parties and then we can engage and build real community that that's the longer term project um and that's doesn't show up in the poster but it's part of what the posters are about um so there's that and then there's pieces where like we may be you know engaging with people to um, to model for us, essentially, you know, like we have folks from an organization called Casa Justa Just Cause, like they had a really fun photo shoot where they had an action at the Alameda County Courthouse and then, you know, right after the action, we're like, okay, everyone stay there and we'll continue the action a little longer so that we can photograph folks in their element so that we can create this poster for you. <laughs> so there's things like that. Um, there's also kind of just the the constant engagement around what's needed um and then the the last piece i think which is the the skill share where it's really about how do we pass on and keep this lineage of a tradition going like for me it's really important to see mujeres like young women in the practice because it's been a it, printmaking has been a practice dominated by men for a long time but I get, I feel really, really hopeful because I look out to the to the young women that are like leading folks, uh, the leading folks at Bama, and they're in their mid twenties. I'm getting closer to my late thirties. They're in my mid thirties now, and I see more and more mujeres and gender queer folks leading that. And so then I feel like, yay, <laughs> you know, finally we can chip away at. Um, the way patriarchy even plays out in our spaces, right? Um, so like that's that's an important part for me. It's like okay, even within the margins, we continue to marginalize folks. So like, how do we in our practice try to decolonize and undo some of that? Not that we're not going to make mistakes. We're going to continue to make mistakes, and hopefully, some you know people will reflect on them with us and will improve. But um, I think it's a process too. I think we're constantly learning. Um, yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, one of them being, um, is there any relationship building with uh, younger kids, like from ages maybe 5 to 12, 13? And then second question is, um, do you know of any printing, communal printing press? Um, because that's something I've been struggling with. I had the fortune of being um, of being taught how to carve with lino and then using a printing press through the Queer Ancestors Project. But now that that's done, I don't like I don't have a printing press. I don't know where to go, how to like get that. Um, yeah. Yeah. So um, to be really transparent, that like the younger age, um, I think we're not as um, experience working with the little ones i think they come through to like the big community events so like you know this weekend we had the kids of some of the printmakers and they were printing and they were helping and um but i i'll just be real like i'm not very well versed in how to deal with little kids because it is really different 
So we haven't, like we don't have a lot of experience with like that age group. Our experience tends to be with like probably like 13 and up, as far as <laughs> you can go up, the people that engage, you know, like engaging elders. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, I'll just keep it real. I'm like, I don't really know how to deal. Like I've been, lear I've actually been learning how some people have, I mean, just even technically engaged in a printing pro process with kids because you have to have, um, you know, a certain set of equipment in order to do screen printing. Um, but I, yeah, I have like very little experience with little ones. Um, we should talk. Uh, there's a, is it a Gutenberg press that they have at Eastside? So there's a Dino Eastside Arts Alliance in the San Antonio district in Oakland. Okay, so they're, they're a collectively run um, cultural center and they have a Gutenberg press, which I don't know that much about that, but I guess that's a really great press. Um, so they're gearing up to start opening it up for use. Um, I think they're projecting to have like the first two sessions with like lead artist Juan Fuentes is gonna be one of them because he's really moved from screen printing to lino cut um, so that people can come in and use the press this year. So I could put you in touch with folks there so that you can be in the loop once they're ready. Yeah, it's, it's huge. It's like probably half of the stage. It's huge, it's really, I mean, I think it's nice. <laughs> like I said, I don't know. <laughs> some of like the social media and the digital and, and the digitizing of pieces by some of our elders. They're kind of poo-poo <laughs> that stuff. I mean, I think it, not in a bad way. Like I think what I've really heard is like there's a real desire to not lose the handmade, the artisan piece of it. And I, I think that's right. Um, but I think maybe partly because of our age, we kind of straddled this place where we can, you know, it's not so hard for us. Like we've been able to kind of stay engaged on social media. Like I don't Snapchat or do kick <laughs> because I'm like, I don't really understand how to do this. So that's like the line, right? I'm like, okay, I'm too old for that because I just don't get how to do this. <laughs> but I do Instagram and like tweet minimally and do stuff on Facebook. So that's kind of the generation we're at. So I find that it's, it's not an either or. Like I have a whole um, little case study around that poster that I did in Solidarity with Egypt. So we hand printed like a couple hundred of those and gave them out in San Francisco. And some of those handmade posters um, over the next year made it back to Cairo in the youth-led um, protests, because when we made them, the call was for Mubarak to get out, you know, to be ousted. A year later, they were saying, we need to get the military junta out of here, and that's what the youth movement was. So, you know, it's like different targets, right? It's like, when are the people finally going to really have um, the ability to have true democracy? And um, so I was like, well, demand. Someone got that in their hands, something that was handmade, and took it there. But before that, within the within 24 hours of me uploading the PDF, the PDF was downloaded in Bangkok and used at a protest of the Egyptian embassy in Bangkok calling for the, for the top of the Mubarak regime. 
So if I hadn't put that PDF up and gone to sleep, and then, like, you know, while I was sleeping, they were doing this, they wouldn't have had access to that graphic. Um, and similarly, and interestingly, um, a street artist in Cairo, two years later, started, he cut a stencil from my piece and started spray painting it all over. Never gave him credit for it. <laughs> Signed his name to it, has been published as a feminist artist with it, whatever. But it made it to the streets of Cairo in a way that really resonated with people, which is why like he's getting all these opportunities. Um, so you know, those the, the ability to share that emotion that I had around what I saw happening in Egypt and Tunisia, like I wouldn't have been able to share it as broadly without something like a website and a PDF and social media. So I'm like why wouldn't we use every tool that can liberate us? You know, I think just like the actual revolution in Egypt, I mean, it wasn't just Twitter, right? Like, it was organizing, but Twitter helped. <laughs> I, I feel like similar with the, like, with our, our ability to sustain the traditions of like handmade, artisanal, um, graphic work that's really beautiful but not also to like shy away from the tools that like when we're thinking of the political projects that they're connected to, like we've got to use them because who knows what it's going to take to really get us to those places that we want to be. And then yeah, like the stuff that you had said, like in terms of like who's the who, who's the one, who, who are the people that are able to like put the images out and reflect the realities and have their filters. I think that's really important too and I'm really hopeful super hopeful about that because I already see the difference in the kind of work that's coming from the folks. Yeah. I think because we're a small group, maybe we can break and just have a chat. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and that we've got all this such amazing stuff on film, Melanie. You are so generous. It's like the best space I've been in for Yes, without doubt, it's an inspiration. Thank you. So we're a small group. Can we give a hand for Melanie?